Dallas Willard's idea of a gone bathed world and Celtic Christianity. I'm here in Northumbria, one of the centers for the origins of Celtic Christianity. And we are going to be talking about Dallas Willard's idea of a God bathed world. I think this is going to be good. This is the Sanctus Forum, and I am Michael Stewart Robb, and welcome, everyone. We are here, um, like I said, in North Umberland in England, um, Northern England, so right below Scotland, and we're talking about Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy. That's this book, this edition. If you are in Britain, I'm aware, you you got a lot more of the paperback, um, <laughs> and... Uh, but this is this is the um, first, or I guess the American edition, and we're in a chapter um, chapter three called um, "Our God Bathed World," and a little section that um, is called "Space Inhabited by God." That's what we're talking about today. Um, this is one of those longer conversations, which means that. If you're watching, um, you may get tired of watching, and for that purpose, we actually have a podcast that you can listen to, which means that um, if you get tired of, I don't know, using <laughs> using video, um, look for Sanctus Forum on whatever you use to listen to podcasts, and uh, you can you can find us there. Do subscribe to whether it's the podcast or the YouTube channel. Um, that helps us sort of let you know when there's new videos uh, coming out. And, um, you know, if you if you actually like these videos, it is helpful to um, let us know that as well. Uh, but um, one other thing before we get started here, and I introduce um, Roy Searle, who is our, our guest here. Um, if you ever wonder how we actually fund what we do, <laughs> It's through people that uh, give to us. And one of the ways that we'd like to um, help people to give is by giving away a free book here. Something to say is what it's called. I'll try to put it right up in front of the camera so everybody can see it. It is a comprehensive bibliography of Dallas Willard. And everything that Dallas Willard has published, um, or even some things he didn't publish, um, are in this book and you can easily find um, something new to listen to or read from him from this. Go over to sanctus.institute slash friends and you can um, get uh, sign up for a free copy of this by becoming a friend of Sanctus. Um, however, if you live outside of uh, Europe or outside of the United States, we can't find a way to ship them to you yet. So you can still give. Um, however, we can't find a way to give you the books just yet. Um, okay, I am here with um, Roy Searle. Is that am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty okay. Good. good. There's a there's an e at the end, is. which is very confusing, but it's Searle. Um, Roy is um, somebody that I've just gotten to know here, and I've actually wanted to get to know him for a little while because um, when I was. Uh, younger um somebody introduced me to this thing called the northumbria community and they had a celtic daily prayer book which was um i think used in some different things that i was a part of mm -hmm. and um and i you know you'd chew up on websites then that's pretty much all anybody <laughs> had back then and and you'd see this this man roy searle who was who was on the website um well, Roy, um, as I've as I've learned, um, began um, his pilgrimage in this on this earth in uh, an unchurched family and in unchurched environment, and it was only then later in life when he discovered um, Jesus, discovered the church family, and then trained to be a Baptist pastor and did that for uh, a few years. Was a 
uh, Baptist pastor in in England. And um, but then, um, well, we may get into this a little mm-hmm. bit, but um, felt that um, n- he was looking for something, something else. Something wasn't quite um, coming together for him. And out of that sort of search for something else, he and a couple of uh, colleagues founded the Northumbria community. Northumbria Community, and Roy will tell you, tell us a whole lot more about this, is a, an intentional community. It's a scattered community. Um, they have a rule of life that's focused around availability and vulnerability. And um, they have daily offices or daily um, prayer times. Roy doesn't, um, isn't a leader in the community anymore. And this is where the connection with the Baptist churches in Great Britain starts to come into play as he's always been a connected with pioneering works within Mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain. So um, church plants, new church expressions, different ways of of um, reaching out outside of the church walls. And now he does a lot of mentoring, um, does consulting for churches. He's writing a book and we'll see um, what that looks like Mm -hmm. when that comes out. But um, really fascinating man. And oh, did I mention the Celtic Christianity connection? (laughs) So Roy, that was actually that was usually that was a my, pretty long it introduction. It was, wasn't yeah, it? Right. I, <laughs> I should have taken notes. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll cut that one down. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Roy, for um, joining me here. And well, welcome to Northumbria. To yes. Here. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a really um, this place that was once a cradle of Christianity for Europe. That's that's something that um, I did know before coming here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually interesting. This gets us into our topic right away. The reason why um, I first read The Life of Cuthbert, which mm-hmm. is Cuthbert's mm-hmm. is a sort of the, the main or primary saint here for this for this area. Is that... Uh, no? I, I, he, might be ri- he might be rivaled by Aidan. Okay. Aidan yeah. and Cuthbert. I mean, they're Aiden two Cuthbert. great okay. men of God. And Hild as well. So I, I, would, put, I, would, okay. I would have the three of them there. Okay. Well, you're the, you're the expert. Um... So I read Life of Cuthbert. It's it's connect. It's in a edition called the Life of the Age of Bede. There's a yes, there's a yes. I think it's Oxford puts it out maybe. Age of Bede. It's it's in there with the uh, the Life of Brendan, who's the yeah, the, the history of the English the guy that went over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I read it because Dallas Willard recommended that right, I okay. that I that people read that. It must be a, good then. If Dallas recommended it. Well, at that point uh, in my life, I was. I had discovered a list of books that he, um, I think it probably was assigning it to, to people, mm-hmm. and it really went through all of church history. And right. it just I just thought, well, this is a great reading yeah, list. Yeah, and so yeah, I just started sure. sort of marking off the books, and that's how I yeah. um, discovered these writings of people um, writing about sort of the saints of... And, of, you uh, know, Cuthbert is so relevant for today. Yeah, uh, you know Cuthbert drawing as the Celtic saints did on the desert monastic tradition, yeah. but living in an era of of world change. You know, mm. this was the this was the end of the Roman Empire. Mm. You know, everything was being shaken, yeah. and he was also living in it. He was living with compromise because okay. he was a Celt at heart. Yeah, and yet he found himself actually after the Synod of Whitby, where the decision was to go with the Roman tradition. He found himself working in a tradition that wasn't his by choice mm-hmm. and it's that kind of how does his spirituality enable him to live out his faith in a way that is in a slightly compromised yeah. both church and and changing world a very uncertain world so yeah. the story of Cuthbert I think yeah. is really relevant for us today yeah well it is not very long um so if you get this this book I mean it might take it's not exactly an easy, easy That's read, not, but yeah. it's also not very long, yeah. um, under 100 pages or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and I, of that series, that's the one that I liked the best. I thought it was right, the most okay. well-written um, right. and, uh, yeah, just a very interesting man. Mm. I did try to, I did consider 
naming one of my children Cuthbert, but it just, in German, just my work. family, it just would have been Kutzbert or something like that. <laughs> okay. It would just okay. been horrible. Uh, uh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Roy, um, how, um, tell me a little bit about how you actually came into contact with Dallas Willard or this book or you're, you're actually, what we didn't mention is you're on, uh, you've been on the board for Renovara UK for for years. Yeah, from, the, from its origins, yes. Yeah. I'm the old man on the board. I used to be the young man. Now I'm the old man on the board. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, how does that come about? Give us a little bit of the connection there. Well, I, I, coming from an unchurched background and, and eventually, you know, life turning around, going to uh, Bible college with my wife. And I first came across in 78, Richard Foster's Celebration mm -hmm. of Discipline. And, and I found that inspirational, but actually really practically helpful for, for, a, for a young believer who was trying to make sense of, of, of what it meant to, to live with God, hmm. to, to follow Christ. Um, and so, you know, I've returned to Celebration of Discipline in most Lents. And okay. when after a number of years, after 13 years nearly in, in local churches, and we formed the Northumbria community, which is never intended to be a community. We were just asking some basic questions, a few of us, and then we discovered a lot of other people and out yeah. of that emerged a community way of life. Um, spiritual disciplines became really important to us. Um, we hadn't got a clue what to do kind of uh, outwardly, hmm. but we knew that the first call upon our lives was to seek God. Hmm. And, and how do we seek God? We don't seek God without those internal and outward disciplines. So... Hmm. Richard's books and it was really through friendship with Richard um, we we published uh, Celtic Daily Prayer Harper Collins were our publisher and the editor at that time of Harper Collins overseeing religious publishing publishing in this country was um, a guy now a friend James Catford and uh, James was publishing some of Richard's books mm -hmm. and um, basically James got Richard and I together and okay. and it's out of that friendship that there came the introduction to Dallas and just uh, just the joy and privilege and, and honor, as it were, of sitting on uh, you know at the table with Dallas, uh, mm. and and just deriving wisdom, but also being incredibly challenged to think deeply about what faith really means, and and what were the influences that were were shaping my life from the culture of which I was a part, mm. but but what did it really mean to to, to, to be alive in the spirit and to live in the spirit, not in the yeah. flesh. And, and I, I found Dallas's writings, both Divine Conspiracy, Spirit of the Disciplines, really helpful in those particular regards. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that you came to um, Richard's book, Celebration of the Disciplines. It was published in 1977, 78. Mm. So you read it pretty close, mm. you know, first edition, first printing. Original green, green paperback book. Yeah. Um, but you came to that from an unchurched mm -hmm. um, background, and I think a lot of us um, who grew up in the church, mm -hmm. um, we encountered that book, and it was pretty pretty revolutionary for our thinking. Right, and well, you see, it wasn't revolutionary to me. It was like yeah. it was it was the thing. My my worldview was changing because I had encountered Christ. Yeah. Um, and, and so the influences, my worldview, my outlook on life was being changed by the spirit of God at work in my life. Yeah. But but why Celebration of Discipline was so helpful was it wasn't that one of those books that telling me what I ought to be doing, mm -hmm. but actually it was how I could do these things. It was very practical. I, and I, it, for me, it wasn't a revolutionary thing. It was just like a we used to have in, in the UK Haynes. Uh, manuals on car maintenance and it basically it, it was written by somebody who really understood what a car was hmm. what the model was hmm. and who really understood how the whole thing worked and really understood how to get better performance out of it and if it wasn't working well then it, it also instructed and guided and, and and for me celebration of discipline was a little bit like a haynes manual yeah 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 written by somebody who who understood something of the interior life yeah. the inward journey yeah. as opposed to just you know doing things as a christian yeah yeah 
Well, I know a lot of people listening probably, maybe they've heard of the Northumbria community. Mm -hmm. I hope they have. Um, I hope they have. But if they haven't, um, give us a little bit of introduction to that and especially help us a little bit with this this Celtic connection. Um, Okay. Why the Celts? I mean, yeah. Uh, Well, uh, there's a simple answer to why the Celts. Okay. We're in Northumbria. Okay. Uh, and but but the longer answer is to say that um, in the, in the kind of mid eighties and and I was pastoring a church I was I'd been pioneering planting a church in a urban housing estate and then I was the senior pastor of a large charismatic evangelical church mm-hmm. um, and and you know I was busy doing the stuff mm-hmm. but there was a a sense that step outside the the doors of the culture of my church and into the reality of the world all around me that actually revival wasn't that it felt more like exile than revival hmm. and and basically with with a few friends here in the northeast of england in the ancient kingdom of northumbria um i discovered there were other people who were asking similar questions that were really about well who is it that we are really seeking have, have we made god in our own image hmm. uh who is god what does it mean we i, I ended up running like a CEO, a church, you know, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. trying to keep the customer satisfied, putting yeah. in programs and activities. Um, and it just caused me to question, what, what was this all about? Hmm. Um, th- there was a lovely little incident um, that actually, I was going to say changed my ministry, but changed my life when I have four children. When one of my children, Joshua, came into my study as a youngster one evening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I... I said, hey, Josh, it's great to see you. What, 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 what do you want? Nothing, Dad. And, well, shall we play? No, Dad. Shall we um, shall we read a story? No. Are you hungry? No. Thirsty? Mm-hmm. No. All right, we brothers and sisters? Yeah. Mum, okay? Yeah. And, you know, children can be quite disturbing, really. Uh, mm-hmm. But I just said to him, Josh, what do you want, son? And he just said, I just want to be with you, Dad. Mm-hmm. And, and out of the mouths of babes... But God used that experience to, to really both encourage and challenge me that I had become so captivated or so caught up, not captivated, so caught up in the running of church, in mm. the delivering of programs and, mm. and teaching and preaching and home groups and, and mm. mission and everything else, that something of the heart of my faith, which is relationship with God. Yep. Uh, so... That was my personal. I, I needed to go. I needed to go deeper with God. Yeah. I wanted to go deeper with God. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there had to be more to Christianity than just putting on services and, and doing the stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and or from the uh, user's side, or the user's side, yeah, yeah. from going to services yeah, and just absolutely. having the stuff absolutely. done to you. <laughs> absolutely, and also making choices in a consumer culture about right. like, oh, I like this church because it puts on this and it puts on that. Mm-hmm. And if I don't like mm-hmm. it, I'll shop. Sorry, I'll go worship elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And and that so it was quite disillusioning, um, yeah. questioning period. Um, but I discovered other people. Um, despite being in context which at that time were, were growing, were alive, ostensibly were healthy church communities, I dis- we discovered a, a few other people asking the deeper question, mm-hmm. actually, it doesn't feel like revival's coming. It feels like we're in exile. How do we sing the Lord's Song of Strangeland? Yeah. And as we began to ask those questions, and together with what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in a changing world, yeah. we... We, we we discovered or we rediscovered the lives of the Celtic saints. Okay. And and that's why in Northumbria, you know, you walk the ancient paths and you walk in the paths that Aidan and Cuthbert and Hild, mm. you know, they, they walk these paths. They laid the foundations of Christianity yep. within this area. Yep. So so then, I, I don't like, I'm, I'm sure we've not met each other too long. We've had a brief conversation but I think there's an inquiring mind within you. So I, I, I come across these Cuthbert, Aiden, and I'm kind of saying, yeah, but who influenced them? Where do they come from? Mm-hmm. And and I think this is where there are some uh, mistakes making, made around Celtic spirituality in that if you want to understand Celtic spirituality, you have to understand the influence of desert monasticism. Yeah. Because that was its primary influence. Yeah. So it was a monastic movement. Yeah. And and so as I say, we never intended to form a Northumbria community. But mm. but 
the few of us became a few more and we were finding coherence and hope and meaning and inspiration in the lives of the Celtic saints who whose first call upon their lives was to seek God, yeah. but who actually found a way of, of living out the faith in a changing world that rooted them deep with God. But also it was a kind of it was the monastery and the mission. Mm -hmm. It was the contemplative and the, the apostolic, the active. And, and, and those really are the roots of, of our community. And, yeah. and it was only as we as we journeyed on in years that we then discovered actually God maybe was calling us to be community. Hmm. We reflected on our experience alone and together. Out of that emerged our rule of life of availability and intentional vulnerability. Hmm. And we started to put into words, uh, you know, the, the, recall the memories, the stories, the experience that shaped us. And, and that's how Celtic Daily Prayer came about. It wasn't sitting down and putting a joint liturgical commission together. Hmm. It was giving words and music and, and dance and, and the arts hmm. to to our lived experience of God. And, and there's no doubt about it, the Celtic saints, not exclusively so, because I would say that Dallas Willard, Richard Foster and a whole host of other people, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. they equally have been influenced, but, but the Celts have been a big influence upon us yeah. uh, in their monasticism, in their dismantling of the sacred and the secular. Yeah. That awareness of both the, it's so paradoxical, Celtic spirituality, the, the, the transcendence of God, the imminence of God, the, the God who is, who cannot be grasped and fully known, hmm. but the God whom we see in Jesus becomes flesh and dwells among us and, and kind of touches the earth and touches humanity. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more, that, um, the sort of breakdown of the secular, uh, sacred, um, that's obviously one of the things that Dallas is trying to do mm -hmm. in this chapter mm -hmm. um, and help us um, in the modern world um, get a more biblical or more Christian idea of how mm -hmm. God relates to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and Celtic uh, spirituality and Celtic theology is certainly going to be a real help for that um well their spirituality was forged on the anvil uh, of actually struggle and how to live in the world yeah um you know so so it was kind of birthed not in yeah. any i mean there were pioneers in that sense mm -hmm. uh, this was first generation christians mm -hmm. they were they were having to seek god in the context where what had gone before was was druidism paganism mis uh superstition massive mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. of fear and superstition yeah um yeah pantheon of gods and and their spirituality was forged in that cultural religious context yeah but but they also had to live they had to work the mm. land uh, mm. they had to sail the seas they had to fish the seas right. they had to right look after the livestock right right and i think that's what's fascinating about that is that they are not in a Christianized society. Yep. I mean, these yep. ma early monastics, Celtic monastics, um, paganism, uh, Druidism is really not very far away. It's Absolutely. it's mm -hmm. it's still very dominant in yep. society, and um, and a lot of the ways that they they dealt with the world was. I think we we'd probably look at that and think it was sort of charismatic, Pentecostal, mm -hmm. very. Um, very interested in working with God's power. Absolutely. Um, You've read Life of Cuthbert. <laughs> I've read Life of Cuthbert. Um, but it was also really down to earth. Yeah. And, and you've got that, that lovely, what I think is a really healthy balance between the, 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 the openness to the, to the spirit of God, to the manifestations of the spirit, mm -hmm. the gifts of the spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. signs and wonders and miracles. Mm -hmm. But then, You've got to go and dig the potatoes. Yeah. You've got to go and milk the cow. Yeah. You've yeah. got to make that hazardous sea journey. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, it's a very, it, it's charismatic, but it's a really earthed spirituality. Right, right, right. And I, in a sense, that's the way that a lot of monastic movements are. If you ever go to a monastery, mm -hmm. you ever spend mm -hmm. any time there, you realize these folks aren't just sitting in cells praying. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. There's, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Um, and uh, you, you've you've got to do it. Um, well, one of the things I think for for us um, in uh, the 21st century is um, a re interest in spirituality um, and some of the old paganisms are sort of being dusted mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. and rediscovered mm -hmm. um, and and some of to some degree secularism which was very dominant in in Western culture in the 20th century mm -hmm. is is starting to look a little rusty, a little mm -hmm. old, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly for a newer mm -hmm. generation, not all that comprehensible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's um, there's, and one of the things about the the new forms of spirituality is they don't really stay in their own lane. It's sort of pick and mix, and and a lot of folks are interested in sort of grabbing some of the mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. from the Celtic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, tradition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christian tradition, mm -hmm. because it it sort of fits with, um, uh, well, yeah, it just well, it's, ap it's appealing. Yeah, well, I, but but I, I I what I sense, what I observe, what I hear, is there's a shaking off of the purely secular cerebral mindset. Mm. And people are discovering, particularly young people, discovering that we're actually spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and therefore, in a consumer society, you're going to dabble and dig around and surf mm -hmm. here and surf there. Um, because as I, I think we are. We, we, we are spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the inherent dangers of a kind of Western rational mindset is it, it suppresses the notion that we are spiritual beings. Mm. And, and I think, you know, for me, the great liberating good news of the Christian faith is that actually God says, I'm spirit. Mm. You are spirit. You know, his spirit combines with our spirit, thereby enabling us to cry out, we are children of God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, but there are also, as, as much as there are dangers in, in secularism and the mindset that, that blinds people to spiritual realities, there obviously are inherent dangers within a kind of smorgasbord of spirituality mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. pick and mix. Mm -hmm. But I think that should not put us off um, as it didn't the Celts discovering the Christ mm -hmm. who, who is the one who, who brings redemption, life, liberation, connects us to our, to our spirituality yeah. um, and, and does that work in our lives that opens us to awareness of the presence of God in, in all things. That you don't actually have to go, um, it, it's good and there's a place and a purpose for being in a church service and gathering other Christians, but God can be known anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. He, isn't, he isn't confined yeah. to that, yeah. but, but the notion, and you know, when, I, when I first came to faith and I, I sat in some churches, you, you got the impression that basically you needed to get saved so you could get to heaven, mm -hmm. you know, after you die, you, you'd, you'd get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I it just that doesn't have any truck with me. I, you know, heaven is, is a reality here on earth as it is in yeah. heaven. Um, and, and God isn't like out there, like some, you know, father figure with a beard and, and floating on clouds. And yeah. somehow yeah. if we can journey yeah. beyond the yeah. space and time. Yeah. <clears throat> but at the same time, and I think Dallas says this in, in, in this section, neither is God kind of a, a figment of our imagination. You know, mm -hmm. me and Jesus, my personal savior, mm -hmm. you know, I've got God in my heart. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it's a, it, it can be a helpful way of talking about it, but actually mm -hmm. it can be an incredibly deceptive mm -hmm. and limiting way because mm -hmm. we can't we can't own god yeah god yeah. owns us yeah yeah well i think one of the the ways in which uh, our culture has um uh tried to reimagine the presence of god or the presence of spirit the presence of something mm -hmm. transcendent is mm -hmm. not to um think of it as something extremely f far away and mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to try to f um 
the word is uh, imminence uh -huh. and the idea of, of trying to find an, an imminence for God. And one of the things that sort of gets exciting for people about Celtic Christianity is this sort of, well, didn't they teach that God is, is in nature mm -hmm. and that God is um, behind the natural processes of the world? And, Absolutely. And, um, and we can find God there. Yeah. Now, how would you differentiate that from um, more sort of pantheistic uh, conceptions of God, where God is everything and everything is mm -hmm. God, or or just um, I think C.S. Lewis has this bit where he's talking about um, the concepts. I think this is in. Oh, I can't remember. I think he's talking about nature and the word nature and how that's used over mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time. And he mm -hmm. talks about how um, all of the old um, paganisms and gods sort of got kind of died off and nobody cared mm -hmm. anymore. But mm -hmm. the one that was the hardest to kill or to to die and for people to forget about was the one that was connected with sort of nature as a whole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So how did how would the Celts or how would you differentiate between we see God in nature. We see God in creation, and something that's what well, distinction between creator and created. Okay. Yep. Uh, and I think it, it, it's only that encounter with Christ that actually moves you into that deeper, richer experience of God. Yeah. That enables enables you to distinguish between that which is of God's creation. I mean, I I, I do think. I mean, some people have described creation as like the fourth member of the Trinity, um, and and certainly, I mean, I, I I came to faith while training to be an outdoor pursuits instructor okay. in, in the Cairngorm Mountains of Scotland, mm -hmm. and and one of the the factors for me in coming to faith w was actually walking the mountains, sailing the seas. Mm -hmm canoeing the rivers yeah and, and and a sense of like wow that there has to be so much more mm -hmm. uh than this just coming about by accident that there, there, there there's a there's a there's the, there's the hallmarks of a designer creator here yeah. my, my 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 wife um a significant also unchurched totally unchurched background mm. um my wife had a profound experience in the japanese gardens in in cologne germany okay. and and just looking at the at the koi carp in the japanese gardens hmm. was just awakened to the reality of of, of like the transcendence of god hmm. but it was a while later before she came to faith um so i i would i would see you see i i think you know with the global crisis and global warming and everything else i i think it's horrific what we've done to our planet hmm. and i think a great deal more respect for what God has created. But I do see that mm. in creation, in human encounters, in life, we can see the hints and fingerprints of God. But but the encounter with Christ mm -hmm. is the encounter that leads us to distinguish and discern between that which is creation yeah. and that which is the creator. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, and you, you cannot uh, you you cannot confine God to creation. God is I would say God yeah. is 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 actively engaged and involved in His creation. Yeah. But God is more than creation. You know, it's yeah. like I mean, you can you can look at my 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 study, my upper room study here, mm -hmm. and you can you could come to a, an opinion or an impression uh, about the way I've arranged my books, the, the, yeah. the way I actually designed this place. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 those, these things would tell you a little bit about me. But, but now that you've met me, mm -hmm. you'll have a deeper appreciation of perhaps why these things are yeah. the way they are. And I think it's that encounter with Christ yeah. that opens our eyes. It, 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 it kind of, the scales come down and we start to see things not, to use Pauline language, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Yeah. yeah. And we, I think, you know, I would often take people, last week I was on a pilgrimage, I would often take people out into creation mm -hmm. and, and just encourage that awareness of the presence of God at work in his creation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I would also, I mean, you live in a city. 
I would also be encouraging people to cultivate awareness of God in the midst of city life. Yeah. So it's not all roses round the round the door and you know babbling brooks and you know sure. nice little birds singing. It's 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 the whole of the world. I think you know God created a world and said it was good. Mm. Okay, it got spoiled and despoiled by sin, but it's like you know God loves this world. Yeah. And, and and you know I think actually with God living in this world is a, is a safe place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we well we dealt with that uh, that question there. Um, right. uh, this is a perfectly safe place for us to be. It's it's, it's difficult yeah, yeah. to believe um, sometimes. Um, well, the security is in God. Yeah. Not in necessarily the context or the environment. It's. I mean, yeah. Dallas talks about it, doesn't he? Um, forget. It, it's the Mark Four. It's Jesus in the storm, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's you know, it's, it's like, whoa. It's it's but the storm is just terrible, you know. Doesn't yeah. he care? Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I'm yeah, sure we, yeah. we we many a time said, doesn't God care? Right. But actually, with 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 Christ in the vessel, in the midst of the storm, we're kind of okay. Yeah. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Yeah. 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 Well, I I have to I have to do this. I'm I'm thinking of this this section here, and um, what's what stood out to me. Um, reading it this time around is um, Dallas's, I guess Dallas's philosophy. And what he's trying to do is help people through philosophical theology reconceive mainly, mainly secular minded people, not necessarily mm -hmm. um, sort of the, the Druids and the pagans that mm -hmm. Cuthbert would have been dealing with, mm -hmm. but secular people who have been taught that basically space is just space it's just mm -hmm. emptiness mm -hmm. and then there's a few molecule molecules that are crashing into each other mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and that's it and then there's really not much left for gone yeah um and he he's using um he uses the human personality um as a kind of um analogy is actually too weak what he thinks is that the human personality is where we get our first direct encounter with what spirit mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. um, and this this comes this is right out of his work in phenomenology <laughs> right okay um where there's um a great deal of interest in um, analyzing consciousness, analyzing um, what it means to be um, bodily beings, what it means to, um, and then and then separating and distinguishing things and all of that. And um, I th I I think it's I think it's rather helpful mm -hmm. um, the way that the way that he does it. Um, but he has this idea here. Uh, this is kind of a, a long setup, but. Um, you know, we occupy our bodies, but we're not localizable mm -hmm. in our bodies. And at the same time, you know, you can an analyze my foot if you want to, but um, that probably won't be a way to sort of find me or for me to, to show up. And he has this idea that the face, there's a, for me, this is at the end of 75 and the beginning of 76, where He's talking about the face of a human being, mm -hmm. and he means a little bit more than just their sort of this sort of circle mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. here. He means sort of the hands, face, shoulders. That's really where people sort of express themselves, mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. show up to other people. But to change metaphor, it is just a vehicle, isn't it? It doesn't. We are spirit. Mm -hmm. Um. I think he refers in this chapter, doesn't he, to the, was it the Communist Institute in, in Moscow right. that tried to dissect some of these eminent communist brains mm. to find out what kind of made them, who they were. You're not going to find your spirit in your foot. Uh, yeah. But our spirit inhabits mm -hmm. our bodies. Yeah. So they are, in a sense, the, the, the vehicle to give expression to yeah. something that is 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 spirit as opposed to the material and the physical yeah and and i think um and i think I th i'm pretty sure dallas at first this i i see this in my grandchildren i see this in my young grandchildren 
that there's a kind of almost a natural connectivity between their spirit mm. and and how they express themselves. Yeah. And and uh, and again, I'm, I'm pretty sure Dallas both touches on it here and dwells yeah, it in no, his other writings. No, that's in here. Yeah. Uh, right. That you know that as we grow into adulthood, we often mask and we find ways of managing so that we protect ourselves in mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. uh, and we don't see uh, we, there's a discrepancy between the the human spirit who we really are yeah. you know, the core of our being our yeah. heart yeah you know proverbs 4 23 pay attention to your heart because the heart is the is the core of our mm -hmm. being our spirit this is where the life is found it's certainly when we we, we come alive in christ and alive in the spirit it's like it's awakened within mm. us we, we, we're birthed with new life um, but we have to live our lives with our bodies as they are. Hmm. Uh, I mean, there'll come a time when, you know, uh, our bodies will, will, will fade and disappear and go and perish yeah. and all the rest. Yeah. But our spirit lives on. Yeah. And, and, you know, God is spirit. And I think this is the, the secular mindset falls short in, in recognizing the reality of spirit. Mm -hmm. And and I I think what you're seeing in a in a in, a, in an emergence a rediscovery a reemphasis on spirituality for a lot of people is the human spirit kind of wanting to get out of the prison yeah. of, of just being I mean we live in a very technocratic society yeah yeah and and we are we are more than simply products we're more than things we're more than material yeah. matter yeah yeah but you know it's just it was bound to reemerge because it just doesn't secular secular mindset doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it yeah. sort of leaves out too much, and it leads to such an impoverished life. Right, and and even you know most of the things that human beings actually care about, like you know, the arts or politics or Love. these are these these are expressions yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. of human spirit. They're not yeah. expressions of yeah. human bodies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so um, there's he has this idea that human beings um, can show up or will show up if they want to and and can yeah, then yeah. hide themselves yeah, if they yeah, want yeah, to. Yeah. Now, what he does, and the, if you you haven't noticed this, you know, or you're reading this section again, the conclusion for him comes about the middle for me of sixty six where he says, now roughly speaking, God relates to space as we do to our body. So he's looking, he's trying to help people get a new vision of how God is in this world. And he sort of says, okay, look at what, look at how you operate, where you are, mm -hmm. your spirit, and you can show up through your body or hide yourself through your body. That in a sense is how God makes, is present in the world and can also be present in specific ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or withhold um, his presence mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, specific mm -hmm, ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Lots to talk about there. You're <laughs> smiling and I can see the wheels turning. First of all, is that something that um, the Celts and um, the folks um, in the Northumbria community would recognize? They may not put it that way, okay. but yes, they would recognize that. And... I mean, as I said earlier on, Celtic spirituality is incredibly paradoxical. So there is a, a recognition that, that, that God occupies, inhabits his world, but can't be contained by it. Mm -hmm. But in human encounters, in a child's play, in the love between a couple of people, mm. in, 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 in the playfulness of, of bees around a sunflower seed, there's there's something of the presence of God, the activity of God in those things. There's there's something about you know I mean, the scripture where two or three are gathered together in my name. That there's something there's a dynamic that happens when when God's people uh, gather together in the name of Christ. The Spirit of God is is at work. There's something in the assembling together of God's mm -hmm. people. Don't forsake the assembling together which I think is far more than just gathering on a Sunday morning or, or whatever. <clears throat> but there's, there's, but God can be known. I think the Celts would be saying God can be known alone and together wherever. 
the, you know, it's, it's the cry of the psalmist. If I go to the highest heavens, the deepest depths, you're there, God. But there's also the paradoxical pieces. The Celts recognised that there were places hmm. that they would speak about as thin places. Okay. These would be places of encounter. Okay. Um, it's a bit like Jacob wrestling with God. Okay. In, and the conclusion, surely the Lord is in this place. I could take you to Lindisfarne, Holy Island, off the Northumbrian coast. Okay. So how far away is that from here? That's about 20 miles from here. 20 miles okay. from here. Okay. And then, you, and then we, if the tide's out, we can get over mm -hmm. uh, for a few hours. If it comes in, we'll have to stay over there for a few hours. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could take you, and I have known people that have gone there as holiday makers and tourists. Mm -hmm. And in walking some of the paths, mm -hmm. something has happened. Mm -hmm. um, a lovely, very quick story about a film producer. Um, who, who actually, at the end of a day's filming, spent the night on Lindisfarne Holy Island with their film crew, but they, they basically spent a lot of time kind of drinking, and um, the adrenaline was there, and they went back to their digs, but they weren't sleeping, so they went for a walk, mm. basically in the early hours of the morning. And they, they came off the main path and, and found themselves in this little, like, hollow in the ground. And, and slumped in the ground and looked out towards Bambra, which was another historic site, and had a, and, and, and had an experience of God hmm. that utterly changed and transformed their life. Hmm. They knocked on the doors of one of the companions of our community uh, as early as possible the next morning and said, I don't know what, this is somebody from a non-church background, I don't know what's gone on, but I have met with God. Hmm. Hmm. What they were unaware of is that they had fallen into what for them was a hollow in the ground, was a prayer hole that's mm. been a place of prayer for mm. some 1,400 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carved out initially by the monks. Yeah. And, and, and it's been a place where people in the know, if you like, go and pray. Yeah. And yeah. Now, I find, that really, I find that really difficult to kind of comprehend, mm. but I have to accept the reality that actually God shows up Hmm. There, there, are, there are manifestations and experiences of God in certain places that, 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 that carry, it's like, it's like the veil between heaven and earth seems kind of very, very thin, yeah, very, very thin. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, the Celts would want to dismantle the sacred secular divide. Yeah. So it's, it's so paradoxical. It's paradoxical, yeah, yeah. There, there's um, that idea of, of thin places, of there being places where... Um, over the years, God has met with various mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, reminds me of one sort of contemporary um, incident where the, the Church of England, I believe, had discovered that one of the reasons for people rediscovering Christ was by people walking into their their mm. churches, their cathedrals, mm. or yep. just ancient chapels, and that, yep. and uh, have you seen this, yeah, this oh, research? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And um, and just being, it's um, one of the few places where there's growth. People attending cathedrals. Yeah, and they're struck by the, I guess the, this the seriousness of a place and the depth of the place and something that doesn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. Yet, but in there's 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 a sort of uh, a sense of presence there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that causes them to sort of seek deeper, and then mm -hmm. they find out mm -hmm. about well, Jesus. Well, and again, there's the, it's the paradox, isn't it? There's that there's something because because I teach in a college just at the back of Durham Cathedral, okay, and and I've spoken to people who've just like wandered in, mm -hmm. and there is there is that sense of the transcendence. The mystery, something that is beyond us, mm -hmm. that is unattainable but but desirable. And yet when people sit there, something of the imminence and presence mm. of God is, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. felt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think Celtic spirituality is, is helpful in this regard because it actually recognises both elements. Yeah. It yeah. recognises both. It takes both elements seriously. Um, and it, it, I mean, it, it would also recognize, yes, there are sacred and special places, mm -hmm. but actually you, you cannot confine God to those special places 
um, which is in the story of the film producer who yeah, uh, yeah. who met with Christ. Um, because we, we, we love to have everything under control mm -hmm. and, and we love to kind of like package it and say, if, if you come to church or you, you know, ministry time is when, when the Holy Spirit shows up. Well, actually, the Spirit of God is at work all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, our task is to, and I think Dallas is, is, is urging and encouraging this in, in how to cultivate, for want of a better word, Brother Lawrence is practicing the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Because when we when we become alive to Christ, when when we are walking in the spirit, not in the flesh, you know, the whole world, we, 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 uh, our senses, our awareness of the presence of God sh should be heightened. Yeah. I, I mean, the spiritual disciplines help us. Hmm. They, they, they kind of keep us on track to remind us. But but actually, as we grow in relationship with somebody, so we we. we we grow closer kind of in intimacy and, and in nearness. Um, and, and, and it isn't just to be found in a religious service. Yeah, yeah. There's a story, it's actually a Richard, one of Richard Foster's stories, um, but it's about Dallas Willard, where they, they traveled together to Florence, uh, Italy. Right. Okay. I don't know if they, they did, it was really just, wasn't anything special. They wanted to see Italy. They see it together it's a pretty brought, good place to go brought their wives uh -huh. and and so they saw the uh the duomo so if you've ever seen a picture of mm -hmm. florence there's this gigantic mm -hmm. um cathedral there and then now I, I forget the name of it because i didn't know i was going to tell this this story but there's another um piazza that has a very old franciscan church oh, nice. at it and that's where um you will actually find a lot of the the graves of sort of famous people now if i'm if i'm correct i believe michelangelo is buried there what? i might be wrong i might be wrong about that but there are some mm -hmm. some famous mm -hmm. artists in that mm -hmm. who wanted mm -hmm. to be buried there rather than in the in the mm -hmm. much more impressive duomo and they're pondering this together richard and uh, Dallas and mm -hmm. Dallas says that points out that this church was connected with the Franciscan movement right, so much yeah. more than than the big yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. cathedral was and that for many years and decades after that was still a very special place for people mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. wanted to yeah. in their death be connected yeah. with that place yeah, 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 yeah. thin place there's a thin place for yeah, them. Yeah, 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 I don't sure. know if it still has that sort of yeah. character I, I don't know. as well, but um, so that's and, and, and to say that you know when you talk about the cathedrals and, and the chapels and those thin places, um, I, I, I and, and I, I see I'm I'm aware of, of younger people hmm. who've, who've drifted into cathedrals or, or younger people who've gone to monastery and convents. Uh, many of them unchurched um, yeah haven't been brought up in the faith whatsoever and and i think there's that you know peter berger sociologist it's that sacred canopy that that mm. secularism just kind of likes wants to rub out but it won't be rubbed out it, it, we talk about the princess diana phenomena when she when she died mm. the flowers the roadside shrines and, and everything mm -hmm. else there's, mm -hmm. there's that sense in which actually there is something more to the material and the physical mm -hmm. that, that that actually we need to acknowledge and i think it, it's often in these these buildings that have been built for the glory of god and these buildings like the the franciscan chapel that you're talking about that have been prayed in places mm -hmm. there is some connectivity between prayed in places it's yeah. almost like yeah like a legacy of spirituality is yeah. is kind of there that 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 those of us who wander in now can kind of cash in on because mm -hmm. deposits have mm -hmm. been yeah. have been placed yeah yeah you mentioned paradoxes in celtic christianity and and listening to you speak i'm reminded that really that the northumbrian community is set up with a pretty important paradox built into it and and that's connected with what we're talking about here so there isn't anybody in your community who wouldn't love to come over here to northumbria and see the different sites and mm -hmm. visit holy mm -hmm. island mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if they live in australia mm -hmm. it'd be wonderful to, to come here because they're mm -hmm. connected with a 
with a community that sort of has this rootedness in place mm -hmm. and is mm -hmm. researching this history and connected with it. But the majority um, can't. The majority can't. Yeah. At the same time, you're intentionally a dispersed community. You're not trying to build up monasteries yeah. here. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're taking this, your rule and the daily prayer, and you're pushing it into ordinary spaces yeah, yeah. that really don't have a history of being spiritual mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. um, and very ordinary, I mean... I don't know where, where you say the daily prayers, um, but I'm sure it's all over the place here. <laughs> it, is, it is all over the place. It's, it's monastery on the road for me because right, much of my right. time is is literally spent wandering for the love of Christ and, 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 yeah. and traveling. Yeah, it, it's it's for some people, it's at the hearth, it's around the table, mm -hmm. it's in their upper room. <laughs> It's 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 on the road yep. for the for the for the commuter who travels into the city of London every day from from Surrey. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's it's them sharing their daily office, saying saying their daily office yeah, yeah, on their yeah. commuter train. Yeah, and it's yeah. that. I mean, Merton Thomas Merton was was also an influence on community in mm -hmm. the in the early days, and you know so his his you know his his phrase in his book contemplatives in a world of action. Yeah, I, I think is where you've got. Celtic spirituality um, you know you've got the desert fathers and mothers but they were quite it's not quite the word isolationist um, they were very much cloistered mm -hmm. um, they didn't last too many generations their influence lasted longer yeah but I think the genius of Celtic spirituality was to take the the the, the monastic roots the stability mm -hmm. from, of monasticism the rootedness in God but then took that spirituality, that worldview, to engage with the various cultures in which they found themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we mentioned before about Druidic culture. So the Celts didn't go in to kind of impose Christianity mm. because that's not the nature of God. You see, God, God is spirit. God is love, you know, um, seeks to let that love be known and looks for love response. Mm. Love, love doesn't come about by force or control or coercion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so the Celts methodology was was actually to to pray to live the life to, to to let god be god um but what they didn't do is they didn't go into a say a druidic culture and obliterate it and say this is terrible this is wrong this and the other yeah they saw within druidic culture um teachers who were teaching wisdom looking for wisdom and what they did is, of course, they shared the good news of Christ, who is the wisdom. If anybody lacks mm -hmm. wisdom, let them seek God. They'll mm -hmm. find wisdom. Mm -hmm. So many of the Druid teachers actually became teachers of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christ in encountered them. And I, I think there's a, there's a great tendency for us, in, in particularly Western approaches to spirituality, to want to, to kind of dominate or to impose our yeah. particular tradition or, or, or way yeah. of of spirituality whereas i think the genius of the celts is you can be a celt mm -hmm. uh in tasmania you can be a, a celt in vancouver yeah. you can be a celt in 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 ukraine mm -hmm. because the essence of celtic spirituality it is not so um localized or nationalized or parochialized that you're not going to say, well, if you went into this Celtic community, it would be exactly the same as that Celtic community. Yeah. But there would be a worldview that would be similar. Yeah. yeah. Down to earth, no sacred, sacred, sacred divide, quite monastic, seeking God, strong emphasis on relationships. Yeah. Real respect for the creation of the world, for, for the environments, ecological issues. Yeah. But distinguishing it, distinction between creation and creator. Hmm. And incredibly celebratory. I mean, creativity and innovation. I mean, see, there's something in the human spirit that can't be confined to, you know, I mean, we haven't only great pieces of furniture in this room, but mm -hmm. we've got some nice pieces of furniture in our old 1783 house yeah. uh, down the way. Um, but, and you can say that's a nice piece of furniture, but, but behind that is the, is the gift of creativity hmm. that the craftsman who made it made it and i think the human spirit speaks about 
values, about insights, about inspiration, about creativity, innovation. And the Celts, just, they embraced all that. Look at the Lindisfarne Gospels, look at the Book of Kells. Yeah. They're wonderfully creative pieces, um, bringing alive the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, studying the Celts and saying daily office is uh, it's only one part of your job, certainly one part of your, yeah. your life history. You've also had a rich history in congregations or in with with um, Baptist and other um, oh, traditions yeah, in, right across, yeah. in in Britain. Um, what what do you what do you see that um, these churches can learn from? Um, a reimagining of how God is in our world, which is, I guess, the topic that we keep on coming back to here with with respect to Dallas Willard's uh, view and how he's trying to help us as well as what we've talked about in the, the Celtic tradition. So what is it that the churches could perhaps some maybe maybe it's been a hard lesson for us, something that mm -hmm. we don't been hard to really, really put into practice or or I don't know what comes to your mind. Um, I think well, Celtic spirituality, one of the things, contributions that it can make to contemporary churches, can we focus on the thing that really matters, which is spiritual formation, how yeah. to love God, mm. love neighbour, love self. It, mm. It's great commandment, but it's also great commission. So it's in Celtic terms, they would talk about the monastery and the mission. Yeah. I think Celtic spirituality would also encourage us to not confine God to a religious view of God, <laughs> <laughs> to a God who loves the world, who is, 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 can be known in the world, uh, a God who doesn't abandon the world, but a God who's intimately involved with the world. A God who be, can be encountered in the world. It's not a kind of hope for when we die, but as a, a, a God who can be known and can be accessible. Um, uh, don't confine God to our own understanding of God. God's, God's bigger than our understanding of, uh, of, of, of who, the, the nature of God. Um, Celtic spirituality would encourage us to, to just awaken ourselves to, to the fact that we are spiritual beings. Hmm. Um, you know, we, we have a spirit and, and, and if you want to go, if you want to connect with God, then it's a connect, it's a spiritual connection. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, knowledge of God is, is great and informing, but it's the knowing of God that brings real transformation. And, yeah. and, and, and I think the Celts would say to us, let's, let's just have a big view of God. And do you see sorry. those things in the churches that you are in contact with in I, 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 I see churches very busy, okay. um, running a lot of programs, a lot of projects, um, a lot of churches, certainly here in Britain, who are trying to survive. Um, they're not exactly thriving. Uh, many of them are simply surviving. Some are living, but not too many, sadly, are thriving. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, pandemic has brought out the very best in some but has also exposed the weaknesses and the things that were there for a long long time yeah um and and, and i think you know if you think back to the celts that they, they 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 were having to seek god ask some fundamental questions about what did it mean to 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 live out the faith in a changing world i think the celts would be encouraging us to say the world has and is changing and so, therefore, the questions that we may be asking are a bit more akin to exile, Jeremiah, how do mm -hmm. we sing the Lord's song, mm -hmm. or, or New Testament, Luke Acts. Was, it was all new territory. Yeah. The temple had gone. Yeah. It, it, what, what does it mean to, where is the Spirit of God at work? I'd yeah. also encourage, I think Celtic spirituality would encourage us to see that the Spirit of God is at work in the world. Yeah. And, and, and actually... Part of our task is to 
join with what God is doing in the world. And for a lot of churches, that's that 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 journey from being the host where we invite people to come to us because we've kind of got it mm -hmm. to actually being the guest in the world and discovering that actually we're fellow human beings and 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 the spirit of god is at work in the world and 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 god is at work in the world and therefore this might kind of tweak and reform and reimagine what what church is th th those are huge i mean for me they're very exciting because i work with a lot of pioneers mm -hmm. who are entrepreneurs so all that stuff is really exciting to them mm -hmm. and i say to all those kind of people who want to change and do everything yeah but we need the stability that roots us in god yeah. which 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 a good church will give people stability and rootedness mm -hmm. in God mm -hmm. and a knowledge of the scriptures saturating ourselves in the scriptures but 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 actually for the for the church that has got stuck we need to just be encouraged to see that this world belongs to God the earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof um, and yeah. the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us in this world not not in a kind of hope for in the future um but actually right here right now yeah well are there some are there some ways that you and you have can encourage churches or people in churches that um would help them become more let's say aware of God in their midst um, we talk about running a lot of programs yeah. yeah and and obviously churches had a lot of trouble running their programs under yeah. COVID and sometimes yeah. we got new ones we yeah, just yeah. created new ones um, but um, if there's if there's people listening and I know actually know a lot of pastors um, listen to this and and they're thinking about you know wow that's that's really great and wouldn't <laughs> uh, maybe I could move to Holy oh. Island and <laughs> but uh, but that's not possible and um, so wondering how how can we you know they have it they've got a community there or people that that mm -hmm. they're shepherding mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, what are ways that um i don't know i'm, I'm really thinking yeah, yeah. quite practically yeah yeah sure well i i think there has to be a, a bit of an evaluation about the the activism and the busyness okay that, that actually can rob us of the things that really matter in life which is relationship with god neighbor and self okay so there has to be a little reevaluation that might lead to some laying down and relinquishing of things mm -hmm. reorientating uh, of times and patterns but then I, I think here you've got the, the 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 value of some of the of the spiritual disciplines. Mm -hmm. So that for some people, things like a daily office, Celtic daily mm -hmm. prayer, without without being driven by something and becoming slave to liturgy, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of people, you know, saying a morning office has just been a very very simple spiritual discipline that mm -hmm. is a conscious thing that is done that then over a course of time becomes an unconscious thing that just becomes habit forming that yeah. feeds <clears throat> i would say that we are not going to to kind of grow in our awareness uh, of god without a phrase we use in our community rule of life saturating ourselves in scripture mm -hmm. um, and that requires a discipline lectio divina or mm -hmm. nation exercise or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the celtic tradition another Thing that was really important for them was soul friends okay um and and and, and i i see in a lot of the, the the pioneering and fresh expressions uh movements that i'm a part of um i uh, I, I see people connecting with spiritual friends so it's not so much mm. gathering together for a meeting but but gathering together i have two soul friends um and you know just as you become the the more you become it's not the right word comfortable with god but the more you feel safe with god the more you kind of open up because you you discover that actually god has your best interests at heart yeah god operates out of pure love yeah soul friends uh, are, are no match on god but i have i have two soul friends who i know that their motivation 
and my friendship with them as as mine with them is for their for their best good mm -hmm. so i've been able to journey with them not in sharing information or yeah. spurring one another outwardly but you know they've been able to ask me questions about you know how is your marriage what's your relationship like with money what mm. are the things that you fear what are the issues that um you know in desert monastic term what are your passions own them what are your logos moi what are those thoughts and images and, and and feelings that just kind of take you away from god and actually having having people with whom you can share at that level of depth with it's an incredibly helpful uh, yeah. way of, of, of growing in faith. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the disciplines, you know, Sunday coming out, I'm preaching on celebration, you yeah. know, uh, embracing disciplines like celebration, mm -hmm. you know, to celebrate life's moments. It's my it's my 10 year old grandson's birthday today. So, we will celebrate that birthday. Yeah. And you see, when we do these things, I, I, I sense that they might say, well, everybody can celebrate it. But but it's almost like we're cooperating with the God who actually has created us as human beings with spirit to celebrate, you know, to weep with those who are weeping, but to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to celebrate, to mark life's transitions, um, to celebrate the faith. Yeah. And a whole host more, you know, prayer, submission, fasting, all these things are all helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can tell that Roy has been an ambassador for Renovare um, for a number of years. He's he um, has from when I was a young man. <laughs> from when he was a, a young relatively man. young man. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, uh, but but I mean, he's not just saying that because he's connected with Renovare. But I know that um, you're saying that because these are things that have helped you. Oh, significantly helped me, but also helped our community. Yeah. Many people. And I think many people in our churches, uh, not just within the Baptist Union, but, but across uh, the UK here, have been significantly helped by, by Renovari and the teaching of Dallas Willard, even if they don't re recognise mm -hmm. that it is Dallas Willard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's kind of seeped into the consciousness of people somewhere along the line, yeah. mostly in seminary, mm -hmm. mostly among church leaders. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if I said this earlier, but I think... You know, one of the gifts and the legacies that Dallas has given us through his writings and also through his videos that you can watch on YouTube mm -hmm. is 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 the inspiration for us to think deeply about our faith. Yeah. You know, Richard says in his preface to Celebration of Discipline, superficiality is the curse of the age. Right. It still is. Yeah. It still is. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think, you know, fruitfulness. Uh, the, 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 you're, you're in a rural area here. Lots of my friends are farmers. We walked through and by the sides of fields last week. You know, there ain't going to be a good harvest simply by just kind of scattering the seeds, not preparing the ground, not, drink, you know, not, not digging the drills mm. deep enough mm -hmm. and, and the same is true in relationship to god and faith yeah. let's go deep and and dallas that's why things like divine conspiracy you cannot read it quickly yeah uh, you know i i can read parts of scripture a lot quicker than i can read dallas willard because mm -hmm. he's provoking us he's encouraging mm -hmm. us he's mm -hmm. inspiring mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. he's and, and he, he's coming at it from all different angles philosophical theological sociological yeah, yeah. you know i mean it's just it, it is a rich smorgasbord of, yeah. of of kind of ways in, but mm -hmm. every way in is, is a deep way in. It's not like yeah. a quick pass. There you go. Yeah. Quick entrance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Um, we have only sort of scratched the surface of this section, <laughs> which, is, which is a yeah. testimony to this book and what Dallas was trying to do with this. But um I've really appreciated trying to make this connection between um, what you've done in your life and the things you've studied um, up here in, in Northumbria and, and with what Dallas is trying to say to people from L.A. and where his life's uh, taken him. Uh, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Really appreciated yeah. as well as enjoyed the conversation. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. 
Thank you all for um, making it to the end here. And um, sorry, if you're actually still watching at this point, this the sun is now hitting us and I'm very embarrassed that I've put this camera in this really strange place um, and we have kind of can barely see this table anymore. But um, yeah, do check out here um, our little book, Something to Say, which you can get as a um, free copy for if you become a friend of Sanctus at sanctus.institute slash friends. We have a newsletter, which you can also find at sanctus.institute institute and um we'll be back um next time probably next week um and uh probably next month as well with another conversation on the divine conspiracy so i'll see you then bye all right now um